Okay, so we're going to talk about receptor physiology today. So over here we have the sympathetic nervous system. Here we have the parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system, these are adrenergic fibers releasing norepinephrine. The parasympathetic are cholinergic fibers releasing acetylcholine. That means that these are adrenergic receptors. There's, we're going to look at three different types of, of beta adrenergic and then two types of alpha adrenergic receptors. And then we're going to look at um, three different types of cholinergic receptors. I've combined the M1 and the M3 into the same because it has the same effect on the target cell. And then the M2 um, we're going to look at separately. So we've got uh, beta adrenergic uh, 1, beta adrenergic 2, and then down here, and then so on. And down here we have the muscarinic cholinergic and then another muscarinic cholinergic that are different subtypes. So as far as these, where these are found, the beta-1 <clears throat> are typically found on the heart, and these activation of these will increase both the strength of contraction but also the rate of contraction. So these have what's called a positive chronotropic, increasing the rate of the heart, and also a positive inotropic, increasing the strength of heart contraction. The beta-2 um, receptors are found in the lungs, and where they're found at is primarily on bronchial smooth muscle. Now, so bronchial smooth muscle. They're also found, however, on the vasculature um, in skeletal muscle. And again, this is on the vasculature, and so vascular smooth muscle. And then the coronary arteries. So this will have the same effect on all that. And then the beta-3 are found on your adipocytes. Um, alpha-1 are on vascular smooth muscle. And this vascular smooth muscle is going to be found um, mostly in the mesentery. So it's the, it's the vessels that supply um, the guts, the viscera. Okay, so vascular smooth muscle. Okay, and then over here we have alpha-2, and alpha-2 are found on the things like axonal endings in, <clears throat> within the GI system, and then also the central nervous system. In fact, this, uh, they're found in the sympathetic outflow. But we'll just go ahead and put axonal endings, um, and then we'll show you how that works. So axonal endings, and this is going to be axonal endings of the, the postganglionic fibers in the parasympathetic nervous system because the sympathetic is going to help control um, the, the uh, decreased release of ACH. As far as our M1, <coughs> M3 receptors, M1 is found in the central nervous system. M3 is also found just throughout the body in vascular smooth muscle. The example we're going to use here is for bladder. So the urinary bladder has a muscle called the detrusor muscle. And so um, one way I, I tell students to remember this is that contraction of or activation of M3 will make you pee. So if you can remember M3 makes you pee, and then also it causes peristalsis and everything else. And then finally, M2 are found in the heart. And this is found at what's called, is what is called the SA node. And so activation of these receptors are going to decrease um, the rate of contraction. And we'll look at how that does that. So we're going to go ahead and plug in beta um, norepinephrine into a beta-1 receptor. So when we plug in norepinephrine to a beta-1 receptor, what we're going to do is we're going to activate a GS protein. In fact, the GS proteins, all of your beta receptors are linked to GS proteins. So your beta-2 receptors are linked to GS proteins, and likewise, your beta-3 receptors are linked to GS proteins. All right. Now, activation of a beta-1 receptor, will, will, and then its linkage to the GS protein, will end up increasing cyclic AMP. So we're activating adenylene cyclase, which increases cyclic AMP. That's going to increase protein kinase. When we increase protein kinase, what that's going to do is that's going to increase the entry of calcium. So we've got this calcium channel right here, and now calcium is going to come inside. Now, in the contractile myocytes, the calcium coming inside is going to plug into what's called a ranodyne type 2 receptor, which causes calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But the main thing is more calcium coming to the cell, the stronger the heart's going to contract. It also is found on the SA node. <clears throat> where its linkage will cause an increase in calcium coming into what are called L-type calcium channels, and that's going to increase the speed of contraction. So activation of beta-1 receptors on the heart are going to increase both heart rate and increase the strength of contraction, increasing stroke volume. Now, beta-2 receptors <clears throat> are found in things like the bronchial smooth muscle. 
So when we activate a beta-2 um, uh, receptor, what's going to happen is, again, we're going to activate the GS protein, and then what that's going to do is that's going to also increase cyclic AMP. That's going to lead to an increase in protein kinase. And now what we want to do here is we want to relax the smooth muscle. Now, as you remember from the smooth muscle uh, lecture or the smooth muscle um, uh, learning module, is when smooth muscle contracts, it's because we activated myosin light chain kinase. And so when we, in, when we activate myosin light chain kinase, what that does is that splits ATP into ADP and phosphate. It gives the, it gives the phosphate to the myosin head and we get contraction. Well, in this case, we want to relax it. So what we're going to do is we're going to decrease the activity of the myosin light chain kinase, and we're going to increase the activity of myosin light chain phosphatase. So what we're doing is we're removing the phosphate from the myosin head. So again, we're going to increase cyclic AMP, increase protein kinase, and that leads to both an increase or decrease in myosin light chain um, kinase and an increase in myosin light chain phosphatase, which leads to relaxation of bronchial smooth muscle. It leads to vasodilation of the vessels in skeletal muscle, and then it leads to vasodilation of the coronary arteries. Okay, then we come over here to the adipocytes. Now, in the adipocytes, when norepinephrine plugs into a beta-3 receptor and activates the GS protein, once again, I'm going to increase cyclic AMP. That's going to increase protein kinase. And that increase in protein kinase is going to, is going to cause lipolysis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to break down lipids within the adipocytes. And then what I'm doing is I'm taking those lipids and I'm releasing them as glycerol and free fatty acids. And then those can be utilized by muscles during activity. And so maybe some of you know that, that if you start to exercise for an extended period of time, um, right around 10 to 15 minutes, uh, it's individualized, but you start to use fat as a fuel source instead of glucose as a fuel source. And so here's norepinephrine plugging in to release these from our um, adipocyte so we can burn those as fats. Now, activation of alpha-1 receptors, these are linked to what are called GQ proteins. And so GQ proteins, so norepinephrine plugs in here, it activates a GQ protein, that's going to activate PLC, phospholipase C. And what that's going to do is that's going to activate what's called IP3. IP3 then is going to diffuse over here to our sarcoplasmic reticulum where we're storing calcium. It's going to plug into receptor for IP3. And what it does is it releases calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the release of calcium forms the calcium calmodulin complex. That activates myosin light chain kinase. And when we activate myosin light chain kinase, we split ATP into ADP and phosphate. We give the phosphate to the myosin head. And what that's going to do is cause contraction. So here we're getting contraction, activating the alpha-1 receptors. And over here we're getting relaxation, activating the beta-2 receptors. So one of the things that you see during exercise is if I took this individual right here, and they're in rest and digest, what's going to happen is the alpha-1 receptors are found primarily on the blood going in here into the guts. And so those are mediated by alpha-1 receptors. Well, right now, because I'm in rest and digest, I'm not releasing norepinephrine, and so my blood is flowing to my uh, abdominal viscera, my guts, for digestion. Um, and then down here in the, in the vessels in the legs, we have beta-2 receptors. Well, when I have a fight or flight response, what I'm going to do is I'm going to release norepinephrine to alpha-1 receptors. That causes contraction. I'm going to route that blood away from the viscera. And over here, norepinephrine and epinephrine are going to plug into beta-2 receptors, which causes relaxation. So I'm shunting the blood away from my core, and I'm giving it to the skeletal muscles in the upper extremities and the lower extremities. Then we get to our alpha-2 receptors. With alpha-2 receptors, these are going to be linked to a GI. I stands for inhibitory. And so when we, when we inhibit it, what we're going to do is we're going to decrease cyclic AMP. That's going to decrease protein kinase. And that decrease in protein kinase is going to decrease calcium entry. So over here, what we're doing in these axonal endings, because if I were to come over here, and I'm going to find this alpha-2 receptor right here, on this axonal ending. So let's say this is the vagus nerve, and it's going to release um, ACH onto an M3 receptor, which causes peristalsis. But if norepinephrine plugs in this M2 receptor, 
what happens is by is by decreasing my cyclic AMP and decreasing my protein kinase, I'm actually going to close down this calcium channel. And so now calcium can't come in to allow the release of acetylcholine. All right. Okay, so now we're coming down here to the um, to the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers, and now I have my M1, M3 receptors. Now this pathway you've already seen because when I activate this pathway, this is also linked to a GQ protein. When I activate the GQ protein, I activate PLC. That's going to increase my IP3. IP3 is going to diffuse over here to my sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's going to release calcium. And now when I release that calcium, it's going to form that calcium calmodulin complex. It's going to activate myosin light chain kinase. That's going to split ATP into ADP and phosphate. I'm going to give the phosphate to the myosin, and that's going to lead to contraction. So when you're urinating, urination is a parasympathetic response that causes contraction of the detrusor muscle. When you're relaxing, you've got rich, inter or rich um, uh, distribution of these M3 receptors on the intestines, and so when the vagus nerve releases ACH onto the intestinal tract, it's going to cause peristalsis and contraction along that tract. Uh, and then as you transition into a fight or flight response, not only are you routing the blood away by plugging uh, norepinephrine, these alpha-1 receptors, um, to, to the blood flow to the viscera, but I'm also going to plug into alpha-2 receptors to decrease my um, acetylcholine release onto these M um, muscarinic uh, receptors. And then the last thing we have here is the M2 receptors. So the M2 receptors are found on the heart. So what we're going to do is we're going to decrease heart rate. So you're going to learn about this next term, but the heart has this spontaneous rate of depolarization. The, the SA node has this, has a resting potential of, resting membrane potential of negative 60, but it doesn't stay there. It, sorry about this. It constantly is drifting towards threshold. And so what's happening is I'm spontaneously drifting towards threshold, and then I'm going to fire off, and I'm going to have a heartbeat. Now, in here, I have these two different channels. I have what's called an IF channel, which we'll look at next term, and a transitory um, calcium channel. When I can, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to get up here, I'm going to open L-type calcium channels. Now, the heart wants to beat all by itself, but what release of ACH onto the M2 receptor is going to do is it's going to slow our heart rate. So this right here is happening about 100 times per minute, but when we have a rest and digest, ACH is going to plug into this M2 receptor, and that is going to activate a GI protein, because what I'm doing is I'm going to inhibit this whole process. So I'm going to decrease my cyclic AMP, and I'm also going to directly open a potassium channel. Now when I open a potassium channel, potassium is going to leak out, and it's going to hyperpolarize the cell, so already I'm starting to decrease the rate of my, of my heart. But then the other thing that's going to happen is the decrease in cyclic um, AMP is going to take a calcium channel right here, and it's going to close it down. So now, because I'm closing my calcium channel, because calcium was coming in right here through a T-type calcium channel, but now that I'm kind of putting that on a little bit of lockdown, it's going to take longer for me to get to my next heartbeat. And so this is going to have a negative chronotropic effect. So once again, the, 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 the decrease in cyclic AMP is going to come over here, and it's going to close down this calcium channel. So I've hyperpolarized it, and then I've slowed, it, um, slowed down the rate. Okay, well that's it for the receptor physiology.